listening to Not Crazy, a Psych Central podcast, hosted by my ex-husband, who has bipolar disorder. Together, we created the mental health podcast for people who hate mental health podcasts. Hey, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Not Crazy podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and I am here with my co-host, Lisa. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gabe. So today's quote is, a delusion held by one person is a mental illness, held by a few is a cult, and held by many is a religion. And that is actually a super common saying, so we're not going to really have an attribution. Do you mean there isn't one, or you just don't want to give the person's name? I could not find where it comes from originally. Comedians have said this, posters say this. It doesn't seem to be something I can pinpoint down to one specific person. Well, we are very thorough in our research department, which consists of only Lisa. And Google. Lisa and Google. (laughs) It's Lisa using Google, so you still get all the credit. So we're going to be discussing religion in this episode and no doubt alienate 90% of our audience. This is a great choice for a new podcast. Like, remember all of those records that we hit last week? Well, those are gone now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but you never know. The 10% that we keep, those are going to be the best ones. So those of you who are not already alienated, you're my favorite. There are some people that just, they don't want to hear the topic of religion. You either agree with them and you're good, because if you disagree with them, you're bad. Now, our show is designed to bring in all sorts of points of views, all sorts of topics. So we're not trying to alienate or offend anybody. So so please put on your big boy pants and, and, and take a listen. I, I promise it will be worth the journey. Now, Lisa and I, we are not very religious people, which is why we, we have a guest coming up in a few minutes who defines as a, as a person who is religious. And because we, we did want to be fair, we didn't want an hour of, of Gabe and Lisa talking about how religion wasn't important to us, but everywhere we go, spirituality, religion, it comes up as one of the pillars of recovery. And this strikes people like Gabe and Lisa as odd, but it comes up so often it must not be. Well, it shouldn't strike us as odd, though, because religion is quite common in our society. It it permeates almost everything around us. So it's really not surprising that it's in the recovery community, that it's involved in mental illness and mental health. It comes up for everything. The concept of a higher power is probably the most well-known place where religion is in like addiction recovery and 12 steps right the, t- the 12 step group aa is the most popular but there's also like emotions anonymous and then there's support groups classes etc so the this higher power is everywhere and i'm surprised i personally have never in my entire life attended or led a support group that in one of the rules or in one of the pillars or in one of the agreements or in one of the steps did not involve religion so so clearly it is on everybody's minds. And I want to talk about what to do, of course, if you don't identify that way. If it's one of the 12 steps, does this mean that you can't make it to the end? It does kind of get messy because now let's say that you do acknowledge a higher power. I've I've heard many a story of people arguing over what that higher power looks like. Well, we both believe in a higher power, but your higher power is wrong. Well, especially in the U.S., the 12-step model really dominates all things mental health, mental illness, recovery, addiction. I've even been to groups or to therapy programs that are not about addiction. I personally never struggled with addiction. And they still say, we use a 12-step model, but that was designed for addiction recovery. So how is that going to help me with my depression? All right, Lisa, I think that we've established that religion in America is prominent. Before we get to our very cool guest, a little background from us. I graduated from a Catholic high school. I was raised Catholic. My father is Protestant. I've read the Bible cover to cover. And while I don't consider myself to be a religious person, my entire family is and works on me weekly to find the church again. So I really feel like I have a good understanding of religion in America. Lisa, I know you're also non-religious, but what is your background? Do you have any? I was raised with religion. My family went to church every Sunday. I stopped attending when I was in college, but I have read the Bible and taken a lot of theology classes. And I don't consider myself to be a Christian, but I do have a lot of background and knowledge about the religion. Now, Rachel Star Withers is the host of the podcast Inside Schizophrenia. She's a person living with schizophrenia. Rachel is a religious person. We're probably going to disagree. Rachel, are you cool with that? I, I absolutely am. 
I love it when I invite people on the show and in the little email, I'm like, look, we've selected you because we don't agree with much of what you've done or said. And that's why we want to make sure that your viewpoint is acknowledged. A lot of people think it's a trap. Do you think it's a trap, Rachel? Yeah. I assumed you were. That's why I was on the show. Was <laughs> That is not voting well for your relationship with Rachel, Gabe. Do you think that we are part of the gotcha podcast media? Is that a thing? No. <laughs> I do, If that is a thing, I want to be part of that. Make that a thing. <laughs> Rachel, we have established that, that Gabe and Lisa are not so religious. Can you talk about your religious background and, and your general feelings, uh, just your personal belief system? Well, I grew up in the South in the Bible Belt. So that's like a church on every corner, very, very conservative type Christianity. And if you're not even like familiar with the South and everything, you have different denominations and some denominations are looked down upon. A lot of the people around here wouldn't even consider like Catholicism Christianity. They wouldn't consider Pentecostal Christianity. It's like, no, you're either like Baptist, Southern Baptist. I mean, you can get a little crazy and be non-denominational, but that just means Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> like legit, that's what that means. <laughs> Are you a Christian? Are you Baptist? What What is Rachel Star Withers religious affiliation? I pretty much always say that I'm Christian and that I believe what Jesus said were the two main commandments. And in the Bible, one of the disciples comes up to Jesus and was like, yo, Jesus, of the 10, what are the main two? You know, <laughs> like if, if I if I just got to stick to two of them, what, what are the main two of these 10 if we're going to really simplify this, Jesus? And uh, Jesus said, love God, love people. That it all could be summed up. And I believe that is the overall message is love something or care about something bigger than yourself and then care about people. Another great way of saying this is don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I am not familiar with the Bible verse where Jesus said, well, the most important thing is to not be a dick. Yeah, it's in there. Um, I will Google that and find the verse. It's reworded. It, it, You're paraphrasing. I like to use King James old school. So it's like <laughs> thou shalt noteth be a dicketh. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, one of the things that, that is kind of striking me is on one hand, you're being like very cavalier, you, you know, but on the other hand, I know that you are very religious and you are also a, a solid studier of theology. One of the reasons that we picked you is because we feel that you're, you're very reasonable. You're not too far one way or the other. Uh, we also picked you because you're, you're cool as hell, but- Right. And available. And available. Right, yeah. that, that's, I mean, that, that's very helpful. You currently define as Christian, but you're not picking a specific denomination. Are you currently a churchgoer? Growing up, uh, my family actually started the church that we went to, and it was like my great grandmother started the church. Oh wow! Yeah, and which is a big deal. Like my grandmother, she taught in the church. Very, very religious background, and it was Southern Baptist, which is pretty much known to be like the strictest. I was on the puppet team and like we had to be careful with the puppets that they didn't move too much because that would look like they were dancing, and dancing was forbidden even puppet dancing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, we couldn't have the puppets sway too much because dancing is not allowed. <laughs> Rachel, I, I don't mean to try to nail you down, but just in, in the interest of the conversation and the debate and to know where everybody stands, if you were pressed to check a box to define yourself as required by the Not Crazy Podcast debating rules. Or the U.S. Census. <laughs> what would you pick? Christianity. Christian. And do you go to church on Sundays? I do not. Can you still be very religious and not go to church on Sunday, in your opinion? Absolutely. I, I now I am in South Carolina. A lot of the churches around here, especially in the current political environment, have become incredibly political, <laughs> which I do not agree with. Uh, so I don't currently go to any church. I study a lot. I still read my Bible very regularly. I actually take a lot of online biblical classes because I love the history and all that kind of stuff. I think that it's interesting that you brought up that church is playing a role where you don't feel that they belong. And the example that you used was politics. Yeah. Segwaying over to mental illness, do you feel that religion has a role in recovery from mental illness? And if so, what is it? I do think it plays a role. I don't think that it should play a role in the beginning. And I don't think it should play a, a large overall role. Now, explain what you mean in the beginning. Like, should religion diagnose you? 
What I always tell people is that's great that you believe in whatever religion, pick one, I don't care. But if someone is having psychosis, you don't need to be taking them to church every week because it's just going to fuel that psychoticness of not understanding reality versus fantasy. And that was a lot of the problems. What happened with me, I was I was starting to have schizophrenia. And instead of getting real help, I had a lot of um, church people being like, well, no, that's Satan. Well, no, oh, that hallucination, that's Satan manifesting. And so they weren't helping me at all. They were telling me, don't get medication and let's pray over it. And everything you're seeing is real. And so I was very untreated for many years because, yeah, they, they made life much more harder for me to get real help. What age were you when this was going on? My late teens, early 20s was when things really got bad. But I grew up and when I was little, I was told the same thing. It just, I kind of thought everyone had demons and stuff. If you go to church every Sunday, well, if you go to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, um, and all you hear about is angels and demons. And then if you're hallucinating like me, that's, well, yeah, obviously I'm seeing the angels and demons we all keep talking about. See, now, for my money, that is why I believe that religion can be extraordinarily dangerous. Because after all, you're, you're right. There's, there's a lot of imagery of, of mm-hmm. Satan doing things. And I've talked to many, many people that say that they did not go to a doctor and they did not get help because they thought that they were just being punished for their sins, that this was Satan's involvement and what they needed was more church. This is why I think that religion and spirituality should have zero part in recovery from mental illness. And, and I want to be I, I want to be clear here. I, I'm talking about severe and persistent mental illness. I understand the the role of of spirituality and mental health issues, you know, a, a anxiety and, and the grief process, et cetera. I'm, I'm talking bipolar disorder, major depression, hearing things in your head. What do you say about that? And I agree with what you're saying. Um, the other side of that coin, which I think is far more dangerous, isn't so much that you're being punished by Satan, is that you're being called on by God. People who are being punished, I feel bad. I'm not going to lash out. And we have so many issues. And if you look around our current political climate and things, it's more so the thought of, oh, we're chosen. I have to do this. I, and that's where it gets dangerous. And, and that's kind of like what was happening with me was it was more so like, okay, God's choosing you to see a realm that you shouldn't see. You've been given special powers and you have now a, a requirement. It's not so much I feel bad. It's... I'm supposed to go and do this thing. And that's where I think the dangerous part is, especially when we're talking about like schizophrenia. You were expressing to people around you, I'm seeing these things, I'm having these visions, I'm hearing Mm -hmm. these voices, and they're responding to you, oh, well, that's God, or that's a demon talking to you either way. Mm -hmm. And that made sense to you, because after all, you'd grown up with hearing about this all the time every week. Why wouldn't you believe that that was sensible and normal? At what point did you start to think, huh, there's something off about this? Or did you ever? I'm going to say I I don't really think I ever. I never 100% believed like other people telling me that God was constantly trying to test me. That's just a lot of testing. I hallucinate like 90% of the time. It's like, well, you know, Jesus, chill, man. (laughs) Um, So I and I feel that goes to where some religious people, if you don't understand mental health and you have someone with a very severe mental health problem coming to you and you're a counselor, you're a leader or whatever, it it gets really dangerous because you you can't give good advice. You're giving very dangerous advice. And I was 17 at the time and I got a lot of very dangerous advice that, yeah, oh, well, that's Satan. You're full of Satan. You have to like now not eat for the next week because you have to get the Satan out of you. And apparently Satan loves food. He's a fatty. So that's, that'll work. Wow. That is so horrifying. And you followed this advice. And if I understand correctly, you followed this advice straight to an exorcist. They told me I had demons in me and they said, we're going to do an exorcism. It, well, I didn't seek it out. I, I was at a Christian school at the time, college. So I was living there. And yeah, they were like, no, no, we got this. And how did your family respond to that? They, I don't think they knew anything about it. Or if they did, it, they didn't realize what level we were at. You're kind of burying the lead here. You went through an exorcism. Yes, I did. I, I, did. I just, you're, you're just talking about it like, oh, I went through an exorcism. Did, like, yeah. like it was just, a, you know, I, I tried that new restaurant and I didn't like it. So I mm-hmm. moved on. No, th- there, there's a lot of trauma that's involved in all of this. What's, mm-hmm. 
What was that like? Because you believed that now you have to believe in order to go through an exorcism, just to be clear, you now have to believe that you are possessed by Satan. And that's why you need this. What was this like both as a human? And of course, how did it impact your symptoms of schizophrenia? Because you believed this. Unfortunately, it was not like the movies. My head didn't spin around. I didn't like spew out black blood or anything. So it it would not make a very good movie is what I have to say. It lasted three days with three different women, one of which was like nine months pregnant at the time. So when I look back, that's my thing is like, because I didn't pay for this. They volunteered. It was like, what are you getting out of this? You're very pregnant lady. But she led it, and it was three days of no eating, no drinking, them laying hands and praying, and me, at age 17, having to confess every sin. I was the, like, best little Christian girl in the world, so it isn't like I had all this wonderful sex parties and orgies to talk about. It was like I had to confess that I watched the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer once. That's the intensity of the sins I'm having to confess for three days. So your (laughs) level of sin with the Buffy the Vampire Slayer was so great that it made sense to the people around you. Demons are obviously possessing this girl because clearly so much sin. So yeah, like what the hell? It it doesn't (laughs) sound like something that's real, right? It doesn't. That people in modern society would actually consider this a reasonable idea, a reasonable thing to do, especially for a child. And something you have to understand is, like, it wasn't even a commonplace thing. Like, to be in, like, a normal church and them say, whoa, you need an exorcism, it would be pretty bad. That means you've already failed because you let Satan in. The fact that Satan was able to even do that. So the whole thing was very shameful. Everybody freaking knew because it told every freaking body because you got to watch out for the demon possessed one. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And then uh, just real life, I never wanted to talk about it. I was so embarrassed. I didn't want my family to know. I didn't, God, I didn't want any friends to know what had happened. I didn't talk about it for about 10 years. And ironically, I then make this video about it, you know, thinking no one has ever been through what I went through. This is so ridiculous. But you know what? I'm going to video because it is a weird thing. And so many people have reached out to me who went through the exact same thing. The youngest being four years old. Wow. The person saying that they'd had them since they were age four. I feel sick. Was this the first treatment that you ever received for schizophrenia? So at the school, apparently the guy I was seeing was a um, real doctor because he subscribed an antidepressant and I was on it for like a few months and it didn't work. So so you you did see a doctor. (laughs) On campus, the campus doctor, yes. Right, you you were prescribed something that didn't work. And so this was the second treatment for schizophrenia that you received. You are a religious person and now you're getting all of these emails for people that are describing that they're getting exorcisms and and other religious ceremonies as treatment. How did that make you feel? Because for me, just to be blunt, it makes me angry at religion. This is why I do not participate. But you very much still love religion, even though, frankly, what you're describing is is horrendous. Yes, you have to understand, if you are religious or you have that kind of background, the very first person you're going to go to for help is a uh, religious leader. Whether you're talking about your Sunday school teacher to a uh, bigger churches actually have counseling centers. They have counselors that are part of your church. It was pretty normal growing up that we would schedule a meeting with the youth pastor or the um, assistant pastor of the church if you were having like a problem in your marriage with your kids at school. So like that's who you would go to. And that's why this, you know, unfortunately is a more common than not thing where they'll bring up, okay, well, let's pray over you. Let's have you do this type of religious thing. And you don't go see like a real doctor or I don't want to say a real counselor because yes, you can be whatever, but you get the idea. You're more likely to have religious help than a normal doctor, psychiatrist help first. We all seem to agree from all our different walks of life and belief systems, that this is not the role of religion in recovery and that that religion should not be doing this, that this is bad, that, that the whole Christian counselor thing, et cetera, they're not trained, they should refer you to real doctors. At this point, there's just no conflict. We we all agree, we all should hug, but we, we completely disagree. I know that we do. Mm-hmm. Where do you think the role of religion belongs? I, again, Lisa and I have established in the beginning, we think it belongs nowhere. Where does Rachel Starr Withers believe that religion is helpful in recovery? 
I feel that once you're on that road, when you have a solid grasp of what's real, what's not, for me, it's very helpful. I pray every night. I pray multiple times a day. It's not always nice prayers. Gabe likes to joke that I don't curse. I curse a lot in my head. And a lot of the time I am talking to my concept of God. For me, it helps to kind of be like, okay, what's happening to me? Why is this happening? And being able to talk to someone who I knows where the world's going kind of helps me deal with where I'm at right now. I, I don't feel like I'm talking to myself. I feel like I am talking to God or cursing at God trying to understand what's happening to me. So you feel that prayer is acceptable as long as you're still seeking medical treatment? Yes. At what point God starts talking back in a booming voice might be a red flag. But how do you possibly differentiate that? Because if you believe that God is listening, why is it so unreasonable to think that he's talking back? That's where it gets a little blurry. And that's why you have to kind of keep religion separated in the very beginning where you don't know what's real and what's not. I've had the opposite problem where I feel that God doesn't talk to me and it feels like he's like talking to everyone else. When I was growing up and still so people always talk about like feeling God and stuff. And I'm like, I never felt that. So I always felt like there was something wrong with me. And I honestly believe 100% that it, it is my schizophrenia. I don't really feel happiness. Just I'm never happy. And I think because it's like chemical things in your brain. And I do think there's like a chemical thing that some people, when they worship God or whatever, they'll be like, yeah, I can feel God. I feel close to him. And I, I think it's a chemical correct balance. <laughs> I have the wrong balance. So that's why I'm not able to experience it. Really? I Yeah, I mean, I do believe people feel God and things like that. And I believe I do hear things that sometimes I'm not 100% sure if that's my hallucinations or not. Man, I've just learned not to react either way. <laughs> so you feel that you are lacking this feeling of God that other people have because your schizophrenia doesn't allow you to have it. Correct. Why could it be the other direction that you don't have this because it's not there? I know from like other people in my life over and over, people be like, well, I just feel so close to God. I just feel this emotional warmth. And the way they describe it to me is what I think of like happiness and things that I also I don't experience. So that's one thing is that I think that there are ways to connect, you know, your body reacts to different things. And I do think people they're reacting to something. But I think that people with depression, with schizophrenia, with bipolar, who don't experience the world like normal people, I, I think that for you to have faith, it, it's a lot more intense because you don't get the happy feelings. You don't get like the warm fuzzies, but you're still looking for guidance and hope and you still need to kind of try and figure out the world. This experience that you had when you're 17 is such a betrayal. And it's so awful. You continue to identify as a believer, but how are you able to not just feel so betrayed that you would be done with this? Well, I don't believe in the people. I don't believe in the people. I don't believe in what they did. It's like that's a complete disconnect from what I think God is. What they did was not religion. They shouldn't have done that. Well, but obviously anyone could say that. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They could say it the reverse about you. Mm -hmm. They're the real religion. They're the true Christians, not you. If the same logic can justify both people having completely opposite beliefs, how are you able to maintain faith in that logic? I feel that there's so much stuff that's happened in my own life. It just doesn't seem random. And if you know a lot about me, you know, okay, Rachel has schizophrenia. She got a flesh eating bacteria. Like there's so many ridiculously over the top things in my life that I really feel I'm like, F you, God. <laughs> like, what the hell? Come on, man. Like I was out helping people and I got a flesh eating bacteria. It's not like I was drinking and going wild with my sex parties and you're going to get a flesh eating bacteria in your face. <laughs> so I, and it's like, I go through things and I'm like, I just feel that that's totally God. So religion is not like a warm, fuzzy thing. For me, trying to understand my hallucinations have never been nice. They've all been very disturbing. I don't want that to be random. I like at least being able to talk and be like, God, I can't take this tonight. Like I've, I've had nights where I've just like, I feel like I prayed myself to sleep crying because I couldn't make the horrible things go away. It helps me to believe that there is something there, that the world isn't all darkness.
that is a common atheist argument that mm-hmm. this is the proof that God doesn't exist because all this mm-hmm. bad stuff happens. But you're seeing it as it's actually almost a proof that he does exist because... Because then it's all darkness. That's the most depressing thing in the world to me, is that it's just darkness then. I don't want to live in a world where it's just horribleness. I have to believe that there is good and people can choose to be good. And there is like something that wants us to be good and be happy and pushing us towards being good. And that's how, for me, I know when religion is good or bad is when people do bad things, when you are hurting others, I don't care what your religious book says. No, no. Then you are like everything else. You are adding to the darkness. And I don't, I can't live in a world with the thought of everything is just bad or has the potential to be bad. There is nothing pushing towards good. So it's interesting that you see religion as as pushing toward good. And uh, the reason that I, I bring that up is because mental illness pushes toward the negative. Is it possible that all of this is just this nebulous concept? It's all very random and uh, there's nothing pushing towards good. There's nothing pushing toward bad. And uh, everything just sort of happens uh, It just happens and there's nothing. It it sounds like you're saying that you have this desire for there to be order. And some people would argue that this desire to have things be planned and ordered and unrandom is a symptom of schizophrenia because schizophrenia and, and mental illness and psychosis is just so incredibly random. What do you have to say to that? Because it almost sounds like you're saying, no, 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 no. There's a plan for me that includes schizophrenia. But not everybody believes that, including the way that we treat schizophrenia. It's kind of a mess, right? And that goes back to kind of what causes mental illnesses and stuff. I'm a belief because I had it since I was a little kid that I was born with it. My parents didn't do anything. My mom wasn't like drinking when I was a baby. You know, there's no reason for me to have schizophrenia except that I just do. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's just like, I don't know, like asthma. It's not like you're bad because you have asthma, but I do think it was something I was born with. While I don't wouldn't say that it's, oh, because I have this God made like a special plan for my life to go and, and save the exorcists or whatever. <laughs> um, it helps me, though, to like feel that, yeah, not everything is bad. That schizophrenia isn't bad, that just all this bad stuff is going to happen to me and hurt and pain, that there is something else out there that I can push towards. It's interesting to me because we we both have severe and persistent mental illness. We, we've both had psychosis. And, and as you know, mental illness has, has caused me great pain and suffering, just like you. And I, I'm, I'm not playing the suffering Olympics. I'm, I'm just pointing that out because we both went through very similar experiences. And what I came through the other side is this has to be random. There can't be somebody that could have saved me and chose not to because that's just too much to bear. So therefore, it's just random and bad luck. And you came through it on the other side that said, well, I can't just have this be random and bad luck because that's too much to bear. There must be somebody up there deciding it. And for a lot of people watching us, they're just like, you know, these are a couple of mentally ill people that their brains don't work Right. I mean, frankly, they don't work right. That's why we're seeking medical treatment. Mm -hmm. Are we qualified to really discuss this at all? Because after all, we started this show by saying, hey, our brains are broken. And uh, I don't know that we're ever going to get to a clear answer because after all, there's demons under my bed and uh, there's colors following you around. What do we do with all of that? Because if we didn't have mental illness, this debate would sound very similar just with different examples. Right now, we're probably the most legitimate people to talk about religion is because we start with, hey, our brains are broken. Okay. (laughs) I feel like we're like more legit because we have that. We can be like, look, we might not be interpreting everything correctly, but this is what I think. You feel that being open to the idea that you're wrong is is a very powerful thing. And we seem to strangely agree on this, which which is weird because... uh, I I don't think that we interpret the world the same at all, but you seem to be open to the idea that you could be wrong. That's very unusual in religious circles. Probably, yes. We'll be right back after these messages. Interested in learning about psychology and mental health from experts in the field? Give a listen to the Psych Central podcast, hosted by Gabe Howard. 
visit psychcentral.com slash show or subscribe to the Psych Central podcast on your favorite podcast player. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. We're back discussing the role of religion in mental illness recovery with Inside Schizophrenia podcast host Rachel Starr Withers. So at this point, you feel that your faith has been a help to you in recovery and maintaining your life with mental illness, you know, living well. But I would say that for many people, it's not a help. It's <laughs> a huge detriment. And that, that would be the reason why I would get rid of it completely. But you think it's worth it. You think the potential downsides are worth the upsides that you have received for me absolutely it's one of the only reasons i'm still here every night i'm cursing towards god sometime because i'm wanting to kill myself and me cursing towards him throughout the entire night is the only way i made it to the morning and that at least that anger of (laughs) that spite sometimes will be what kept me going was that no i'm not just gonna give up no it's helped me to like feel there is something there even if i'm very angry and saying f you i'm gonna do this anyway again you you see and hear things that are not real so you don't have any justification for this other stuff but we're good on this one so how have you been able to balance that and how have your treatment providers been able to work that in For me, there's two completely different things. If I were to start thinking God was talking to me, my knee-jerk reaction is, no, Rachel, that is absolutely a hallucination. And if I get obsessed with something, that's when I bring it into like my counseling for the most part. And I'm not saying this is the correct or incorrect thing to do. I don't bring anything up with religion when it comes to me going to the psychiatrist and talking about medication. I don't say, well, I don't need more medication because me and God had this amazing time at the park yesterday. How would you like to see mental illness treatment and religion separated? Or do you think there is a way that they could be combined? I don't think they should be combined. And I'm not referring to depression because I know obviously there's going to be people listening to the podcast like, no, you don't understand depression. You just even mentioned a little bit ago about being suicidal. For me, those are such small parts of my mental illness. The schizophrenia, the being confused all the time, the hallucinations, that's what I'm referring to. That I don't feel like can be treated in a religious way. I don't feel like I need to go to a church counselor to talk about trying to understand what's real and what's not. Because at the end of the day or at the end of the session, it's going to be like, well, let's pray before you go. And now I, you, you've left that door open for me to get confused again. And it's so hard for me to know what's real and fake. I don't want, I don't know, any more confusion. (laughs) So I rather, yeah, if I'm dealing with becoming manic, if I'm dealing with hallucinations, with reality, confusion, that needs to be 100% separate from normal mental health help. (laughs) Rachel, I too believe that mental health care, mental illness care, and religion need to be separated. But my reason is obviously different from yours. As a religious person... What would you say to your fellow Christians that are going to disagree with you? Because judging by all of the handbooks I've read, the rules, the 12-step programs, people believe that mental illness care, mental health care, and religion should go completely hand in hand. So what do you have to say to your fellow Christians? I think that's why you have to understand there's a big difference between just being sad, being upset over something, and a severe mental illness. You cannot pray away schizophrenia, bipolar. You have something that you need to go to the doctor, similar to cancer, okay? Well, I remember actually being in church and this man getting up in front of like, you know, a couple hundred people and saying he was going to stop his cancer medication because he, he had the faith God would heal him. And I was in the church like, oh, no. Spoiler alert, what happened two years later? Anyway, um, it's the same way. And unfortunately, so many people in the Christian community or even recovery community, drugs, alcohol, they feel that you are experiencing depression, you are experiencing alcoholism, whatever, because of a weakness. And you need God because you are weak. That's one of the 12 steps. Admit you have no control over it and go to a higher power. That does not work for schizophrenia. 
That does not work for bipolar. You don't have bipolar because you are weak. (laughs) You don't have schizophrenia because you are weak. You didn't do anything bad. Okay. And I think that's where the big hole is, is that they're not considering severe mental illness as being real. They're still saying it is like a weakness. It's it's not a real thing. It's, you know. It's interesting what you said there, that the misunderstandings and the stigma and the discrimination towards severe and persistent mental illness is possibly not because they're overinflating the role of religion, but because they're underestimating the seriousness of severe and persistent mental illness. Absolutely. How do we educate religious leaders to get them to understand that, that look, community is important and it's very important. Mm-hmm. Without my family, I would be nowhere. And you've spoken the same way. I, we need our support. You know, I, I am so thankful for all of you. Even the folks on this podcast right now, you have all supported me in, in my dark times. But some of that support has been, Gabe, go to a doctor. Gabe, make a therapy appointment. Yes. You know, Gabe, you need help right now because you're all educated. In your opinion, again, as a, as a Christian, Rachel, how do we help religious leaders see that this is beyond their scope? Because I don't see a lot of religious leaders trying to fill the role of an oncologist. But for some reason, you know, therapy, psychology, psychiatry, they're like, we got this. And I, I don't think they're trying to be mean. I really don't. This is going to sound like the complete makes no sense. And that's kind of like what this whole podcast has been. That religion in so many ways doesn't make sense. Because you'll see like, well, you have to believe in the unseen. You have to believe that God's there, even though you can't see him. I'm a huge Bible buff. I love old school translations, the lost books of the Bible. There's so many loopholes. For every verse, there's another verse that completely goes against it. And that's one of my favorite things is like getting to debate biblical people because you just can't. It's just ridiculous. You could go any direction with any argument. Incest, the Bible is for it. Let's get this on. Lot and his daughters. There's no like right or wrong that you can argue with these things. So, I mean, if you look at it, yeah, your your brain already needs to be scrambled <laughs> to <laughs> fully get and be able to understand and I think follow any religion. You got to be kind of scrambled. And, and yet when you're dealing with mental illness, they're like, well, that's something you can't see. So it's like they don't believe in it. <laughs> they're able to believe like... In a giant floating spaghetti monster, but they're not going to all hail his noodly appendage. Yes. I'm a pastafarian. Raw men. (laughs) But they're not willing to believe, yeah, in mental illness. They'll be like, no, that's not a real thing, though. That's a weakness. That's, you know, you got a really good imagination. Or, oh, that's Satan then. It's not you. It's something else. The idea that your your brain can hallucinate, no, 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 no. We all have these biases and blind spots in our lives. The thing I always find most surprising is well, I'll talk to people, and sometimes ones who are the most atheists are also then the most weird about other things like superstitions and ghosts and aliens, and I'll be like, what? Well, you just made fun of me if you're saying a Bible verse, but you're over here going on about like these magic crystals. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, what is the difference? I'm slightly offended. <laughs> so, that is the thing that bothers me all yeah. the time. Either you're skeptical or you're not. Right. I'm, I'm not being like, oh, it's just Christianity. Like it's across everything almost with us. And I'm sure each of us have our own like little weird things like that. Let, let, let's explore that just a little further, because you are correct. You know, th- this episode is focusing on the role of religion in mental health care and, and, and where religion makes things worse and where religion can potentially make things better. But if, if we take out the word religion and replace it with CBD oil, essential oils, <laughs> uh, yoga, uh, aromatherapy, we, we could crystals. have the identical crystals. We could literally have the identical conversation. Do you think that sometimes people believe that religion is a solution, again, because of a base misunderstanding about how serious mental illness is. And potentially, I'm hoping there's some religious leaders out there that maybe think to themselves, well, I don't believe that CBD oil or or aromatherapy or crystals can cure mental illness, but I sure can. And maybe if they apply it that way, they think to themselves, all right, this is medical in nature. I honestly don't know what point I'm trying to make, which is a theme with this podcast, but as a as a as a Christian, it sounds like you have not used Christianity really to fight schizophrenia. 
a lot of people I know in recovery keep them separate, but I know a lot of people who are literally in harm's way right now because, quote, their pastors got this, their faith communities got this, my faith will see me through, and in the meantime, there's not a doctor anywhere, and I I worry about those people because you got an exorcism but finally made your way to a doctor, (laughs) So many people get the exorcism and then move on to a second exorcism, or then they're told that they didn't pray hard enough and therefore they've got two. These are the things that strike me, Rachel. Push back hard against that. Look at our entire world. <laughs> That's, I mean, we have like thousands of years of this is such a big issue. And if it's not the religions we currently have, there'll be a new one out in a hundred years. There'll be a, some new weird thing we believe in. That's how humans are. We're always going to believe in weird crap. And there always are going to be fanatical people who push it to the next level. For my other Christians, my other religious people, back to the cancer scenario. If you have cancer, that's great you believe in God. That's great you believe he's going to heal you. Spoiler alert. He might have made medicine as that resource of how to heal you. So you can believe and pray to God and still take your medication to get better. Same thing with schizophrenia. I can believe in God and still also believe, hey, I need to take my antipsychotics because that's a whole other level of God talking to me if I don't. That probably is something very physically wrong with me. That's nothing to do with the spirit realms, the ghosts, the alien. For me personally, I I believe that religion is, is a very personal thing. And as long as as you don't push your religion on me, I won't push my lack of religion on you. And and that's sort of how I live my life. It's easier said than done. I'm not saying that I've never gotten to a Facebook fight because I'm only human. And it sounds like that's where you are as well. And I, I think that's a very mature place to be. But I really, as a mental health advocate, I become terrified when people tell me that they are treating severe and persistent mental illness with religion or some some variation thereof. Do you feel the same way? Is yes. this is this like a part where we agree? I mean, yeah, you're setting yourself up to fail. And I think now you can also use that with anything. If I decide to treat my very severe schizophrenia with just counseling, I'm probably setting myself up to fail because this isn't just a hey, I need to go and talk about it. I'm still going to become very, very, very sick if I just sit around talking about having schizophrenia. I, I have to be on medication. I'm on four different antidepressants alone, I'm, and I still go to counseling and pray and all this stuff. Does that mean that I don't believe in God because I have to take four antidepressants? No, it just means that I have an illness that I need to, <laughs> if I'm going to keep living, I have to do this thing. I have to take this medication. Makes perfect sense to me. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Just if you're out there and you're having a hard time and you've went through things like exorcism and stuff like that, know that you're not alone and get help (laughs) because we all definitely uh, need help to get through some of our past traumas. (laughs) And check out Inside Schizophrenia if you want to hear more Gabe, at least. Ah, it's Gabe and Rachel, and it's a really, really cool podcast. It's actually hosted by Rachel. I am just the co-host. And you can find Inside Schizophrenia on your favorite podcast player or by going to the website, which, Rachel, what's the website? Psychcentral.com slash IS. Rachel, thank you so much. You are the bomb. Yeah, thank you so much. You were great. Thank you, guys. All right, bye-bye. Bye. I thought it was great that Rachel stopped by and Lisa, I get to work with her all the time. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> She's amazing. Lisa, what are your first impressions? I have trouble understanding how after going through something so horrible as the exorcism, she still finds a place for faith in her recovery. How about you, Gabe? What did you think about what Rachel had to say? One of the things that I think of is support is extraordinarily important in mental illness. Like my recovery is is owed to my support system. And if your faith community is extraordinarily supportive and accepting, then yeah, I, I love it. But there's this base assumption that every single faith community is accepting of people with mental illness. And that's not entirely the case. So there's this side that we never think about. And if you fall into that side, I want to be very clear that your faith community, your religion can be a detriment. I I suppose the easy answer is if that is your faith community, you can switch. But we all know that that's not so easy. 
Well, and it doesn't have to just be that your faith community doesn't support your recovery and mental illness. It could be that they don't support you as either. You know, you hear all sorts of horror stories of people who are gay and they're rejected by their church, and that can cause a lot of damage. I can also see, and, and this is what I want to get out there, there are congregations and religions that just flat out don't believe in mental illness. So you and your family may well be willing to see a doctor, but of course you're discouraged. I want to give a shout out to all of the faith leaders, all of the communities that notice something is wrong and support and encourage and help. And I know this from from advocacy. Do you know how many churches are involved in advocacy? I visit churches on the regular to provide workshops, et cetera. So I I do have this struggle. I'm really very much in the middle because churches support their communities in great ways. But again, if they can support their communities in great ways, it does mean that they could be a hindrance. I just want to say to anybody that is a hindrance, please, please reconsider. Because with treatment, recovery is very, very likely. There's just so many variables with the specific person, the specific religion, the community, the faith. So there's just no clear-cut answer on whether or not religion is going to be helpful or harmful when it comes to your recovery. The reality is, is your mileage may vary. Not everything is inherently good. Not everything is inherently bad. Exactly. It's all about the specifics of the situation. There's not going to be one answer that works for everyone. One of the things that was curious to me is that she mentioned that when she made this video, she got all of these emails from people who were traumatized by it. And I'm not surprised. I see a lot of abuses like this. And and my email is filled with people who are using religion and and faith to meet recovery all the time. Now, with negative consequences, I I, I should be clear. Like, Maybe that's the thing. Maybe the people who are having good experiences using religion to manage the symptoms of mental illness just aren't emailing me. I do want to be open to that possibility, but the, the people who are hurt, they're just so hurt. And whenever I try to get religion to move forward, like, listen, all you've got to do is stay out of it. Like they stay out of cancer treatment. Just stay out of it. Whenever anybody hears a story of somebody saying, I'm quitting my chemotherapy, I'm not going to an oncologist, I'm just praying over cancer. Generally speaking, people are like, that's not a good idea. But whenever people hear I am no longer taking the medication, going to therapy, or getting help for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, psychosis. I'm just going to pray and and fall on my church community. People are like, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything against religion. I just want them to move over to the same model as cancer. Is that wrong? This is just another outcome or another symptom of the way that people don't perceive mental illness as being an actual medical problem. It's a behavior problem. It's a spiritual problem. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So when someone says, that's exactly what I'm going to do, I'm going to go use religion to pull myself up by my bootstraps. We're like, oh, yes, that makes sense. But most people don't think you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps to get rid of cancer. So if you said to them, I'm going to go use religion to do this, well, that doesn't make sense. You need medicine. So this is just another example of how people do not see mental illness as an actual illness. I think it's really interesting that when people don't see mental illness as as serious or something that needs medical intervention, or you can do the, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps thing. And then it mixes with a controversial topic like religion or medication or other beliefs. It, It becomes this quagmire of we're no longer discussing the best way to treat people with mental illness, but we're bringing in our dislike of discussing emotions or dislike of taking medications or just the way society feels about having a mental illness. And all of a sudden, you're not really discussing the best way to get care anymore, are you? You're now fighting against the thing that you already either liked or disliked when you walked in the door. Do you think religion just falls into that trap that we're not actually discussing mental health? We're just discussing our personal beliefs on religion and we're just having the wrong discussion entirely? Not necessarily. You always say that the reason people aren't seeking out medical care for mental illness is because they don't see it as being serious. And I'm sure that's part of it, but I don't think that's all of it. It's not so much that they see it as being trivial or not being serious. It's that they don't understand the base premise of this is a biologically based problem. 
So it's not that they think, oh, this is a small thing. No big deal. No, you could easily think that this is a horrible, terrible thing that needs lots and lots of care and lots and lots of resources devoted to it and still not think that it needs these specific type of resources. You could think that, oh, no, the resources it needs are behavioral based, are spiritual. So you're doing everything you can, but because of your base misunderstanding of what's wrong. Your base understanding of what's causing the problem in the first place. So you can put tons of energy and resources into solving the problem, but if you don't understand what caused it to start with, it doesn't matter how many resources you throw at it because you're not doing the right things that will work to solve it. This is a grease fire. I I really think that that's a great analogy. This is a grease fire. You believe that the fire is real. There's no debate at the seriousness of the fire that's in your kitchen. You understand the danger. If you have an understanding of grease fires, you smother. You grab the lid, you put it on the pot, you grab towels, you you deprive it of oxygen, it goes out and it's fine. If you don't understand it, even though you're thinking that it's very serious, you spray it with water. And then of course that blows the grease everywhere, the fire gets worse and it's horrible. Nobody is saying that water is bad. Nobody is saying that the fire isn't serious. I think that's the perfect analogy. That is a perfect analogy. Because it's not that people don't think fire is dangerous or that they don't want it out. It's just that they don't understand what it takes to put it out quickly and safely. I sincerely hope that all the people listening to this, no no matter what side of the discussion, the debate that you're on, or most likely somewhere in the middle, and I hope that you've listened to the very, very end. I am very flattered with all of our listeners who take the time to write me to tell me that they disagreed with us, but I can tell based on their their letters and their emails and their comments that they listened all the way to the end. So even Even though they completely disagreed with us, they still listened and considered our viewpoints. They they ultimately considered that we were wrong. I like that. And I want you to know that we have been reading your emails and because our minds have been altered. Our minds have been altered during the research of some of these shows. And I think that that is really, really cool. So keep them coming over to Lisa. What's our email address? Show at psychcentral.com. Again, that's show at psychcentral.com. All right, everybody, I hope you had fun this week. Listen up, here's what we need you to do. If you like the podcast, wherever you downloaded it, please subscribe, use your words and rate us, share us on social media, emails to your friends, tell your mom about us. We do crazy well in the mom demographic. And did you know that after the credits, there is always an outtake, basically where Gabe and Lisa either made a mistake, said something funny, or the whole thing just devolved into a giant fight. We hope that you will check it out. And we'll see you next Tuesday. You've been listening to the Not Crazy Podcast from Psych Central. For free mental health resources and online support groups, visit psychcentral.com. Not Crazy's official website is psychcentral.com slash not crazy. To work with Gabe, go to gabehoward.com. Want to see Gabe and me in person? Not Crazy travels well. Have us record an episode live at your next event. Email show at psychcentral.com for details. have not spent a lot of time in the South and in listening to your fabulous podcast, Inside Schizophrenia. And where could I find that podcast, Gabe, if I wanted to go listen to it right now? I I love that we've just crammed in an ad, but you can find it at psychcentral.com slash IS or your favorite podcast player. See, if you just been smooth on that, it wouldn't have seemed crammed in. It would have been like really cool and like interspirit, but that's okay. It's all right. It's not like you did it wrong. Anyway, so I was listening to your podcast and the thing that I thought was really interesting is you were talking about in the South, there are Christian furniture stores. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Please tell me more about this phenomenon. And that's something like I don't even sometimes realize what's weird to other people and not because I've grown up in it. That was so weird. I looked it up because I was like, that's not a thing. That's a mm-hmm. thing, people. I mean, when I go to fly, I have like in the airport, you can pay to like leave your car there and they give you a little ticket that you show them when you get back and the ticket has a Bible verse on it. That has nothing to do with cars or traveling. It's just, hey, here's a Bible verse wow. on your ticket <laughs> that you have to like keep up with for the next week if you want your car back. And you'll be driving down the road and restaurants that have Bible verses on them. Again, nothing to do with food. Just, yo, place I go to take my car to always has like big God telling you what to do things on it. And I usually, ironically, I always feel that those businesses are less trustworthy. (laughs) But this one (laughs) auto garage that I do go to, they're very, very legit. And they're probably like the most religious auto garage. And there's so many religious auto garages around here. 